Welcome to Talk South Asian to Me. My name is Michelle. And my name is Anisha. Tune in every Thursday at 5 p.m. Central and hear us react to each other's stories about mental health and growing up in different South Asian households. And remember, this podcast is not therapy. Engage with what feels entertaining and resonates with you and leave what doesn't. Yay. I feel like we need to make this like a jingle, right? <laughs> yeah, we need to have a jingle right? after, after right? that first bit. It's like, ooh, it's like, you know, I mean, it's important information to share in the beginning of each episode, but we can make it a jingle or something. I don't know. But it, it needs a transition. Yeah. yeah. If there are any, any musically inclined listeners yes. and you want to create a jingle for us, I yes. would love that. Yes. Please let exactly. us know. Exactly. Please. Please help us out. We are not musically expert experts. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> not even close to musically inclined. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The only thing, the closest thing was I played the flute in middle school. And that's it. After that, uh-huh. I was a nerd. <laughs> I played the recorder. Oh, recorder. I remember that from the good old days. Do you remember the recorders? Yeah. yeah. I don't pass the recorder. I don't. Yeah. yeah. No, no talents. That's okay. Well, yes. Anybody else? Well, help, help, help us out. Okay. Yeah. Are you ready for Q? I'm so ready for All Q. All right. So Let's do a title review. For happiness. Yes. It's, I feel like when I first, when we first thought of this topic, I was like, wow, this is heavy. This is going to be heavy stuff. What did you think? Really? Okay. I was thinking this would be a really fun, light topic, unlike most of our stuff, actually. (laughs) What? Okay. Interesting. Two sides of the coin. Two sides of the coin, exactly. (laughs) But I will say, as I started, like, thinking about it, I I kind of saw the other side of it a little bit. Mm. Well, maybe we'll both see each other's side with our conversations and stories. I love that. We'll teach each other. There you go. (laughs) Okay. So wanted to start off by defining it. So according to – I found this article by Positive Psychology. I know we mentioned that before. Mm-hmm. Um, and the title of this article is What is Happiness and Why is it Important? And the author of this article shares the Oxford English Dictionary definition and then goes into more of like the psychology definition. Okay. So the English Dictionary definition is that It's kind of like three definitions, so I'm going to read them out loud. Happiness is a state, not a trait. So it's not like a personality trait or or a characteristic of a person. It's just the circumstance, the state you're in. Yeah, state of being. Happiness, yes, state of being. So it doesn't – that makes it – it allows it to not be permanent, which makes sense, right? Happiness is not permanent. Mm -hmm. Happiness is feeling pleasure or contentment, but not joy, bliss. Um, And then in psychology, happiness is more stable. Mm -hmm. It's a more stable state than pleasure. Okay. Okay. That surprises me. It's not joy or bliss. Yes. Okay. External experience, which I feel like a lot of us might already know. Like it could be, you know, a person can feel happiness internally, but also exhibit and display happiness Mm -hmm. externally. Um, I do that a lot by like jumping up and down. <laughs> You've probably seen me do it. <laughs> yeah, makes sense. Um, <laughs> clapping your hands. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, positive psychology <laughs> happiness. When pos- the positive psychology definition of happiness, and when it comes to research, so there's lots of psychology research out there when it comes to happiness. And the measure of happiness that they use is the subjective well-being. Um, so typically in research studies, happiness is measured by like a person and how, how what their well-being is. So the subjective well-being. Um, another quote from this article that I thought was good to point out was that happiness can be defined as an enduring state of mind consisting not only of feelings of joy, contentment, and other positive emotions, but also a sense that one's life is meaningful and valued. So happiness isn't joy, but it can include feelings of joy. I know that's kind of confusing, but there's also other, like any other positive emotion can be associated with happiness. And there's another aspect of happiness, which is the sense of one's life is meaningful and valued. 
that adds to happiness. You know, the it's not joy, but it can joy can exist makes me think of, you know, that I always forget which one's which, but it's like the square can be a rectangle, but the rectangle can't be a square, I think. Yes. That's kind of what it reminds me of. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of confusing, but it it makes I, I kind of think of a happiness as like the umbrella. Yeah. Right. And joy could be part of it, but it's not – joy isn't happiness. Yeah. I think that's that makes sense to me. Yeah. Just like, you know, with the square example, like the square can be a rectangle. Wait, is that right? Or is it the other way? I don't know. Yeah. But like one of them is an umbrella so. <laughs> that the other can yes, fit into yes. and qualify to be categorized as such, but the other yes. way cannot be. So that, that makes sense to me. Yes. Okay. Yes. The math nerd just woke up inside me. I think it's a rectangle because a rectangle means four sides. And a square can be a rectangle because it has four sides, but it has equal sides. There's your math lesson for Thank today. You. <laughs> I, I needed it. I was not the best math student. It's okay. <laughs> yes, but it's a great – you're right. It's a great metaphor for this concept because it is very abstract. So it's nice to think of it concretely mm-hmm. where happiness is an umbrella. Um, so – the article continues – author of this article continues in talking about how happiness energizes us and is highly sought after, which makes sense, right? Whenever we feel happy, we probably feel lots of energy. Um, and then happiness has three dimensions. Okay. So these three dimensions, the first one is the regular experience of pleasantness, frequent engagement in satisfying activities, and then sense of connected connectedness to a greater whole. So like having meaning. Ah, I love that. So we're experiencing, yeah, we're experiencing pleasantness. We're engaging in satisfying activities and we have a sense of connectedness to a greater whole. And all three things can lead to happiness. So let me get this straight. So it's like emotional, activity driven, and purpose driven. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm. That makes sense. Okay. I yes. haven't thought about it like that, but it does make sense, you know, because happiness can come from these yeah. different avenues. Right, right. And um, I thought this part of the article was interesting where the author discusses the sources of happiness. So where does – typically where do people find their happiness and what as- aspects of life? Mm-hmm. So the list that was, um, that was there, I'm going to read it um, in order of that the author mentioned was individual income – Labor, labor market status, physical health, family, social relationships, moral values, and experience of positive emotions. It didn't say in the article that like those are the order of like how much happiness – it contributes to happiness, but like these were the aspects that were mentioned in the mm-hmm. article. Um, so, I mean, I strongly believe – or me, but like when I saw I the individual – I was going to say – Right? Oh, my God. That's what I thought of when you said that first. Okay. Yeah. Say, what is your belief? Where do you stand well, in that, Michelle? So individual income, like when I saw that, that was like my immediate thought too. Like, okay, like what about money doesn't buy happiness? And I wonder if like this list of sources isn't like one or the other. Like it's like if you have – satisfaction in all of these or majority of these things, then you have happiness. But oh. but I also still till this day, like I personally don't think like money can buy happiness, but some people do. And, you know, everybody has their own opinion. I mm-hmm. personally believe that happiness has to do with the other aspects that's listed too. Um, mm. But what is your take on it? I'm curious. I literally cannot even. I've had this conversation with Aditya. Uh-huh. A bunch of times. Most recently, two weeks ago. Let <laughs> let me paraphrase our okay. discussion here. Essentially, you know, my stance is the same as yours. I, I don't think that money can buy happiness. But here's where I think people get a little confused. It's not that money is buying happiness. It's that money provides us stability and right. security, which paves right. the way for happiness to exist. Right. That's what I believe, too. But – Yeah, because you can't say money buys happiness because if you think about like the – I know there are anomalies and like they're outliers. But if you think about some of these like really heartwarming stories that you hear, like you see, sometimes people who are in a lower socioeconomic status Mm -hmm. have happier, grateful, giving relationships. Right. You know? 
is that a norm? Okay, perhaps it's not because you're in a stressful environment. Perhaps that takes a toll on your relationship. Totally makes sense. But it's not directly correlated of money buys happiness, but rather money gives you space to have happiness through your sense of stability right. and security. Less stress. So I'm not, I'm not going to get on my soapbox. I'm getting no, off no, before I get back onto it. That makes sense to me. And that's how, like, obviously I'm not like hard, like, oh, my, you, nobody should believe money doesn't buy happiness. Like, I agree with you 100%. Individual income is not saying your, like, bank account, right? Like, it's saying what's your income? Like, what's, what's you know, what can you provide for yourself? What's your individual income? And mm-hmm. that's where I think mm-hmm. where you are right spot on and I agree with you is the stability and security that goes back to like our Maslow's hierarchy of needs that we've talked about before, right? We need that stability. We need that security and individual income can provide that for us to move up the pyramid to reach self-actualization slash happiness, right? Right. Um, So I agree with you. And I love the examples you gave because that's exactly what we're going into next is that what can happiness Mm -hmm. look like? Um, And so these examples that they list in this article like sheds light on that, like, that happiness doesn't buy happy or money doesn't buy happiness and it can look in different ways depending on just the person's personality and how they are and what their purpose is and what their brings meaning to them. So the first example I wanted to share was a woman who lives alone, has excellent relationships with her nieces and nephews, gives to charity and finds meaning in her work. So these are examples of people who are happy and these are real life examples of, from a research study. Um, so this person is happy, right? She lives alone. She doesn't have, you know, a romantic relationship, but yeah. she has family and she gives to charity and she finds meaning. Yeah. The next one is a man who is happily married with three healthy children and a relatively low paying job. Hmm. A widow who enjoys regular visits with her children and grandchildren, along with volunteering for local charities. Mm. A cancer patient who has a wonderful support system and finds meaning in helping others make it through chemotherapy. Mm. And then a social worker who works 70-hour weeks with no overtime pay to ensure the children on her caseload are in good hands. Mm. So, as you, you know, I love how these definitions and examples of happiness help us understand that it is subjective. Happiness is not a one size mm-hmm. fit all, right? It, it happiness can look like something one for one person completely differently versus the next. Yeah, and that's really important to remember. And I think if you notice in all those examples that I mentioned in the rest of the examples I was reading too, like there's just so much meaning. Like there's meaning and purpose yeah. in their in what they're doing. Yeah which I think is Absolutely. so important to think about and point out. Yeah. And not not just purpose, but I'm also picking up on like relationships. Like mm-hmm. it doesn't matter Social. which relationship, just having yeah. a solid relationships with yeah. some people. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Whether it be like your coworkers, your clients, your family, whoever. Mm-hmm. Good, good observation. Oh, and that really – yeah, and that really highlights what you had said earlier, right? You know, it, it, happiness is coming from, you know, your – I think you said relationships or connections. I think yes. you said connections. Yes. And um, – Activities. Meaning and yeah. activity, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, I love that. Look at us, learning and analyzing together. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So now – this is obvious, so but I wanted to point this out. Research shows mm-hmm. that there's proof and evidence that happiness and men- mental health has a positive correlation, right? Just wanted to put that out there. It's pretty obvious and understand. Like everybody kind of understands that that if you're happy, your mental health will also, you know, uh, be at the same direction. Like be good. Um, mm-hmm. And then, so this I found when I was researching. Did you know that Hmm. there is surveys that go out globally and there's a global happiness index per country? Did you know that? Oh, I didn't know that, but I feel like I should have because, you know, they frequently say like Norway and Denmark are one of the happiest countries. It's got to come from somewhere this mark. Right. It's so cool. Yes. And so – I, I know participate. So I think it's just surveys that like 
the country or the government like gives like the census, like the census survey that we have in the U.S. And so I, they do it every couple of years. And I think the last time this was gathered was maybe two years ago. So this is the most recent data and it's a survey of a scale of zero being the most unhappy and 10 being the most happy. And so the world, you have a list of a couple. Yes, I do. So, okay. Hit me. <laughs> so the world, the world list had a list of 134 countries. I don't know if exactly oh, that's how okay. many countries we have in the world, but that's what the list had. Um, and the average of the world, so in average of the entire world, the index is 5.54. That's the average, world average. 50%, yeah. right. A little over 50%. And the lowest, mm. the lowest index in the whole world was Afghanistan at 1.86. Okay. And the highest was Finland, 7.8. Okay, that's no the highest. Scores. No perfect scores. Okay. And the U.S. <laughs> ranked at number sixteen in the world, and it was six point eight nine. Okay, now that did surprise me. Yeah, six point <laughs> eight nine. And I wanted to look up some South Asian countries, and so I looked at Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India. Pakistan was number one hundred and six at four point five six index. Hmm. Bangladesh was 116 rank out of the 134 countries at 4.28 ranking. And then India was the lowest out of the three countries, which was ranking 122. And the index was 4.04. Any thoughts? That surprises me. In yeah. a lot of ways. One, I I actually thought the highest number would be a little bit higher. Yes, but, me I mean, too. I, I guess it makes sense, but, you know, I thought it'd be higher. I'm a little disappointed it's not. Right. Um, right. America being 16 does surprise me because I feel like the latest word of mouth feeling mm -hmm. in America right now with our generation is that the happiness being in America is a little bit low and people are talking about going abroad mm -hmm. and just leaving, mm -hmm. <laughs> trying something new. Right. So 16 was a bit of a surprise. But then again, you know, I mean, our generation, there's a lot of us, but I imagine there's also plenty of people who are happy here right. and get, you know, whatever they need mm -hmm. here. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting to share too. And I didn't let, mm -hmm. get a chance to look at the rest of the South Asian countries that apply to, you know, like Nepal and um, just like different yeah. different countries. But it was mm -hmm. just – it was sad that the lowest was Afghanistan, 1.86. Um, and then Pakistan, Bangladesh, and India were like at that order. And there was, you know, yeah. so many rank countries in between Pakistan and India. Like they weren't close to each other at all. Um, like Pakistan being at 106 and India at 122. Yeah, that's really, really low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It simultaneously doesn't surprise me and does surprise me. Yeah. Just because, you know, like in general, I feel like when you call a place home and you visit often, I, I feel like you tend to have a skewed vision. Right. And like, sure, everything might not be perfect right. and like amazing, but it's almost like, wow, that low, huh? Mm -hmm. Right. I would not have thought that just, yes. you know, off the bat. And we have to also like be careful on how we absorb this data too, because I'm sure there's still like errors or misrepresentation or inaccuracy somewhere. But I think this is still a good yeah. snapshot and helps us better understand I just didn't – I had no idea there was, like, a global happiness index. Like, you hear about, like, the economy index, right? Like, all the different, like, mm. indexes out there that measure different things in the world. But I love that there is one, right? That there is something so like cool. this that measures happiness. And you're right. I didn't think about that. But there – I've seen, like, so many videos and reels and TikToks about, like, the happiest country in the world or, like, North, like the Denmark and this and that. Um, 
Yeah. I think de- recently I saw like Denmark being like the happiest country for like elders because they have like little cities and towns for like elders mm-hmm. to like run and live in. And there's a community, which I thought was so cool. Have you heard of that? I love that. Yeah. I, I've heard something similar. I don't know if it was in the same place, but like Denmark, Sweden, and Finland routinely, if I'm not mistaken, take the place for first mm-hmm. in like alternating. Mm-hmm. You so know, what you're uh, saying is we need to move there. happens. <laughs> I think, yes. I mean, let's go ahead and do it. We'll, well try. We'll just well, try. Well, <laughs> I do know that in Finland, the teaching sal- the teacher salary was is it was equal as a doctor and lawyer salary. So when I was a teacher, I was thinking right. about that and learning right. and I was like, wow, this is so it's it. so different. Uh, I know. You know, that brings up a really good point. That makes me think of like how first of all, how many people are actually taking this, mm-hmm. right? Who qualifies to take this? Who gets to take it? Like, who gets a survey? I didn't get the survey. If I did, I would have remembered. Yeah. But also, like, not just who is getting this survey, but how is it measured, I wonder? Yeah. Like, we're talking about happiness in a very, like, these are the three ways that we can measure happiness. Like, do they explain that on the forum? Is it very, very subjective of, like, are you happy? Yeah. Because, you know. I think that's what it is. Our mindsets. When I was reading about it, it was, like, just the scale, like right now, how happy you are, and zero is unhappy, ten is happy, and it was that's like the measure, subjective well-being, and so that's it's, very, very subjective. Yes, though. exactly, exactly. Mm. So, so now that was Actors kind of like a little off, right, right. But it still sheds light mm. on you know yeah. what's going on in the world when it comes to people being happy. Um, mm. so I wanted to. Kind of, so that was kind of the numbers I wanted to share when it comes to the Global Happiness Index. And I wanted to zoom into the US and focus on Asian Americans. So I found this literature review, and this literature review was um, it's called Happiness Across Cultures A Review of Subjective Well Being in Asian Americans. Um, it was published in 2020, and the author is Hannah R. Proctor. And this author, reviewed 33 studies that use surveys to measure happiness in Asian Americans. And one of the Mm. measure or one of the populations was Indian Americans. Um, And they found, or in the, in the review, so like combining all the 33 studies data, this literature review found, the author found that Asian Americans had the lowest social well-being, so happiness, compared to European Americans. Oh. And the Asian Americans includes the Indian Americans. Mm. So they had the lowest social well-being in, than, compared to the European Americans. Do you have any take on why that could be? Hmm. You know, what immediately comes up for me hearing that is Most of us, AAPI here in America, I think struggle with similar things. Maybe not, you know, same things, Mm -hmm. but similar things, particularly some of the things we've already talked about, you know, like cultural trauma, people pleasing, combating our typical, like almost submissive, like nature under the umbrella of like people pleasing. Um, so from that perspective, if that were true, I would imagine if we're constantly people pleasing and we're constantly feeling a little bit of like an underdog, Mm -hmm. more like a minority, right? We kind of want to be part of the crowd, maybe not stand out. We don't feel comfortable doing all of that. Mm -hmm. Then we're kind of constantly thinking about other people and serving them and like kind of pleasing them so they don't, you know, other us. Right. So with that kind of maybe like fear based or survival instinct, I imagine mm-hmm. that doesn't leave a lot of room for being happy. Right. If you're constantly focused on like catering to somebody else for your safety or for mm-hmm. your sense of belongingness. Mm-hmm. That's what comes up. I'm no, not sure though. I agree with you too. That, like, that would be interesting to explore. Right. And my take is too like, I feel like there's like that. It's not, it's not super general. I don't want to super generalize, but like the collectivist culture, like you mentioned, like serving others, putting other people's, their elders' happiness before yours, that could 
maybe play a role in this in these measures but also i love how like this the the literature review and the author focus on like asian americans and compared that to like europe and so like the american experience too plays a role which we've talked in previous episodes about like the integration and the biculturalism and that could probably that struggle could play a role too in causing that maybe dissatisfaction or unhappiness Mm. Right. Yeah. But you're right. I wish there was, there wasn't much. I was like, oh, I want to know more. Like America, why, yeah. yeah. Like why is it low? Why is it lower compared to European records? Like what else does the research say? But I couldn't find stuff. Mm-hmm. But of course I found some things on social media, right? TikToks and reels. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I found this content creator. This person's name is Mina and the handle is at move to the internet. And I loved how what this person said about like the topic that this person spoke about was choosing between individual versus family happiness. Um, So I'm going to paraphrase and quote a little bit. So this Mina said, families always say no aggressively to you for the small stuff. Like when you were young, right? And if you ask for something small, like they're always saying no. And so when Mm -hmm. children immediately get used to that and so they don't even think about asking for the bigger things or the more important things that can make (laughs) them happy, right? And Mm -hmm. so then families, and I love this part, they, they go on and on and on about like, oh, I sacrificed so much for you, for a better life in America, for for us to move across, which is fair, right? They have their own trauma that they went through and sacrificed for their mm-hmm. kids. But like, what about the kids and what they fa- sacrificed for the parents' happiness? Mm-hmm. You know? And this yeah. person in the beginning was like, you know, why would you minimize your own happiness for your family's all happiness? Like, even if you do, you're not going to tell your parents and they're not even going to acknowledge the fact that you minimize your own happiness for them. So like, what's the point? (laughs) Right. Which I thought was so good. Um, And then just like some quotes that I was, um, that I was, um, Think, look, thinking about that, like what I've heard on social media and read about when it comes to happiness is like that saying, like, don't be sad, just be happy. That's another thing I saw on social media, like what maybe parents mm-hmm. say, like, oh, don't be sad, just be happy. Like they just view happiness as like, oh, if I'm happy, you should be happy too. <laughs> right? Yeah. So that was kind of like the social media dig that I kind of did. And I, I just loved how um, the content creator, the TikTok account um, person, Mina, I've moved to the internet, verbalized and how articulated the importance of not sacrificing your individual happiness every time for your parents' happiness. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love that. You're going to see some similar things yes. in my story because those two things like – Right. Well, I feel like I remember you mentioning something like home. this where like mm-hmm. your parents have made you want to feel happy, but I'll let you get into that. <laughs> I'll get into that later. <laughs> okay. Are we ready for my story? Was this the research? This was really good research, by the way. When we picked this topic, I genuinely was wondering, like, how are you going to do research on this one? What is this going to look like? It's a little different than our typical topics. Yes. But this was really good research. Thanks. Thank you for all of your very helpful information. Of course. I learned something. I was – A couple yeah, something. Yeah, I was – thank you for trusting me with it. I feel like you're right. Like, it's different from our typical topics, but it's still so relevant. Yeah. And yeah. I was really excited about it. Uh, I, I love that. And I think you yeah. brought – the exact yes. right research into this. <laughs> Good eye. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. So I wanted – that was kind of the happiness definitions research, but I wanted to focus the Q part, which is the main letter, like quest for happiness yes. and journey towards happiness. And that's kind of like how I'm going to shape my story. Okay. So that okay. was like kind of background information. Yes. Um, so we've talked about this. Mm-hmm. Um, in a previous episode, right, where I'm a recovering people pleaser, mm-hmm. majority of my life, mm-hmm. I'm, I was a people pleaser. And so when you're a people pleaser for the majority of a life, mm-hmm. your own individual happiness automatically becomes a low priority. And it became very automatic and very normal. Mm-hmm. And I grew up in a household where yeah. My happiness was verbally prioritized. Like it was mentioned like, oh, we want you to be happy, Michelle. We want you to do what you love. Um, but when it came to actions, like to follow the words, like they didn't match up. 
Um, and I think this goes back to our culture too, right? That the contradiction is there. Like, oh, like, yes, we want you, Michelle, we want you to be happy, but we also want this for you. This is our dream for you. This is our vision for you. Or and like, I think we know what will make you happy, essentially, right? Right, right. Yeah. right. Mm. And like this, this um, was a cycle. The people pleasing slash like putting, sacrificing your own happiness for the other person's happiness or the elders in the household. So like my parents grew up in a household in which the children serve their parents and tend to their happiness. And there that equated the love for their children. And so that goes back to our people pleasing episode. Like, oh, like if you make your parents happy, they will love you. Again, that conditional love, um, yeah. which is, I think like the harsh truth that I realized about myself was that if I, like, I immediately equated the love that my parents had for me it was only there if I made them happy or I made them proud of me. Um, and that love would not be there. Or I, like, if I made them upset or not proud of me, like, they wouldn't love me. Mm. And so this was definitely prevalent growing up. Like, my mom did it with, like, my dad and, like, I did it with my parents. Like, it was just, like, a cycle. Um, yeah. Yep. Everybody to everybody. Yes. And when it came to like my dreams and goals, like they always encouraged me to go after my dreams and, and if it didn't align with their own, they were unhappy. Um, so like, for example, when I'm doing community service, taking an active role in really religious ceremonies, doing well in school, they were happy and they were proud of me and they were like, you know, showing me off and saying, oh my gosh, we're so proud of her. We love her so much. Mm-hmm. But when I did something they didn't like, like date, or they didn't align with their values like dating or spending time with friends more than they would like, they were unhappy. Mm-hmm. And they would show it, but it was like in the weirdest ways possible, like <laughs> how, how they would show their unhappiness. And so like my mom and I, we kind of are similar in a way, like we're more impulsive. I'm, feel, I'm working on trying to get better, but she would like pick fights and arguments with me and I would regard like, you know react is the same way unfortunately and my one of my um not favors I'm being sarcastic but like one that really triggers me till this day is like silent treatment or ignoring me um right. and acting like nothing happened is another one mm. instead of talking things through and then my dad on the other hand he is not as impulsive but he has his way of showing his unhappiness or opinions and it's through vague comments and implications of how he's mm-hmm. feeling. And so it's like almost as if I have to figure out what he's feeling. So like right. one time while – so growing up when it came to spending time with family or spending time with friends, hanging out, like I did that some of it. But like I would go shopping or to the mall or, you know, sometimes I would we, we would eat out and I would use my dad's credit card for food and shopping. But I would never like outrageously like ex- like spend money where I would go to like like mm-hmm. Prada and buy a purse or st- you know like it was just like you right. know buying things on sale. Um, mm-hmm. And so one time on high school, I was using my dad's credit card while hanging out with friends at the mall. We were eating and shopping. The money that I spent was a reasonable about amount. It wasn't absurd. And instead of directly talking to me about it, my dad would tell my mom how he feels, like how unhappy he was about it. Or he would just say to me like, oh, I noticed you spent like $40 on this day. And that's it. Mm. He wouldn't say anything else. That's it. Yeah. So implying that he wasn't happy with that. Mm. And I'm sure like this has more layers to it. You know, like we can probably have a whole nother episode about finances and money, right? But <laughs> – you know, we never know. Maybe that will be another episode in the future. But that's part of it too, right? Like he was unhappy with me. And instead of mm. being direct with me or talking to me, he was just finding other ways to show my unha- or show his unhappiness. Um, and of course, like mm. that made me doubt myself more. Like I was questioning myself, you know, when he wasn't direct, like it made things worse for me. Um, yeah. And so nowadays I'm learning, like now that I'm older, I have like my own financial means, thankfully. And, um, you know, I'm able to, and I feel like I'm privileged enough now to where I can separate my happiness from their happiness in some ways. And of course, like I still want my parents to be happy, but I'm working toward not automatically sacrificing my own individual happiness for theirs. Mm. 
Um, it's a lot of undoing because it's like years and years of years of like drilled that thing that was drilled into me. And it's so hard because I feel like in this collectivist culture, like that's the expectation. I noticed these patterns with my parents. So I thought that was normal. Like that's what it's supposed to happen. Serving others and their loved ones, loved ones and not thinking once about their happiness was normal. Um, right. So like this act is defying cultural norms, right? So it's kind of my story, my experience with my quest for my own individual happiness. I love that. That's so insightful. And I mean, sometimes it's helpful to kind of look backwards, but, you know, I, I hope that we'll always continue to look in the current moment and also kind of towards the future, right? So I'm curious, you talked a lot about mm -hmm. what your quest has been up until now. What about now? What are you doing today, tomorrow, you know, moving forward to like really feed this quest mm -hmm. for happiness and like feed your inner ch yeah. child's like I natural desire for joy? I like realize like my desire to work for others, like serving others. Like I work with pa pediatric patients, families diagnosed with cancer. And like, that's not my people pleaser in me. That's not like sacrificing my own happiness. Like that's something I do desire. So like that brings meaning to my life and my work. So that's been helpful. Yeah. Um, and then finding ways to prioritize mm -hmm. me time. I know that sounds very like naive, but like what does me time look for me? Look like for me, like what do I want? It's like mm -hmm. finding small things in my life that I enjoy and actually doing them. So for example, like not too long ago, my sister came to stay with me for the week, which was really nice. Um, but instead, like when she, I went to a workout one morning during the weekend and instead of coming home right away, like she was still sleeping too, that helped. But instead of coming home right away, like I really enjoy acai bowls and like smoothies and things like that. And so I just went to go get it for myself and gave myself – you know, some time to just relax and enjoy each bite of that bowl, you know, or when it came to, when it comes to, and you've seen this setting boundaries or protecting my time, my rest, my energy, I'm starting to work towards mm -hmm. speaking up more and asking for protection of that time and energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I e love it so much. And I've, I've definitely seen that. Thanks progression and that Thank growth you. in yourself you. I really have I'm so proud of you and I don't think it's naive at all I think this is amazing and like these are important things that you're doing to like reparent your inner child and like show up for her and like right give her the space to just feel joy and like happiness and you know it's like you said earlier right sometimes growing up we might hear some of our more basic inner child desires be, mm -hmm. you know, like, no, can't have that. No, you shouldn't have that. No, you can't do that. Right. But now as an adult, like, right. you're your own boss. You're your own parent in a sense, right? So you can give her the ability to do those things that maybe you didn't get to before. And in a lot of ways, that could look like material right. things. It can look like self-care things. You know, it could look like boundaries. It can look like anything. Yay, Michelle. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so I'm very proud of you. And I can't wait to see all the all the new ways Love you continue you. to show up for your Heart. happiness. <laughs> we love you. Hearts, hearts. <laughs> well, shall we talk about my story then? Yes, I would love to hear your story. I'm excited. <laughs> Okay, I'm, I'm ready. I'm so ready to talk about my quest for happiness. Um, <laughs> I did not take a lot of time to think this one out because this one came pretty naturally and pretty quickly. This mm -hmm. is something I actively think about, especially lately, and I'll get into why. Okay. Um, but growing up, you know, I wasn't really actively seeking out happiness. I mean, as a child, you naturally gravitate towards it. But I wasn't like intentional or anything with it. You know, I, I think that looking back, a lot of my um, happiness, it was also naturally encouraged. You know, like the the person on TikTok mm -hmm. or, or the reels that you had watched said, you know, I was encouraged to entertain myself even as an only child and not say like I'm bored. Mm -hmm. My mom did not like when I said I'm bored. She was like, entertain yourself. Don't say that you're bored. 
And like now as an adult, amazing. I'm so glad she did because like I don't ever get bored. I can <laughs> easily entertain myself like forever. I will imagine things. I will do things, you know, whatever it is. But at the time, you know, I was always like, oh, frustrating. Like, oh, but I'm bored. I'm like, I don't know what to do. I'm an only child. Yeah. But I also didn't have the tools of like, okay, so what can I do to seek out my happiness in these moments? You know, you're a kid. You don't really have the tools for that. The other ways, you know, that, you know, the, the TikTok talked about, you know, the be, just be happy. Don't yes. be afraid. Don't be worried. Don't be. Yes. Don't be Whatever sad. it is, just be happy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I got that in the form of like. Just smile. Why aren't you smiling? I hate that. Even if that. I was just like resting. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. That it's like, but I'm, I'm in a neutral. Yeah. Mode. I'm not even mad. Yeah. I'm not even sad. <laughs> I'm just neutral. I'm resting. And this again, this also came from mom, but like this has this is like all of mom's mm -hmm. stuff. When she saw that I wasn't smiling, I think there was like an overdrive of like, what's wrong? Is everything okay? Why isn't she smiling? You know, just, like, overthinking and all of that. And, like, to this day – like, she doesn't do it anymore. But to this day, she'll jokingly say it because she knows she's just, like, yeah. trying to poke at me. <laughs> but I've told her so many times, too, you know, as I grew up, it's okay for me to not smile, Mom. It doesn't mean right. anything's wrong. And even if it, there is something wrong, like, it's okay, Mom. Right. You know, the idea that happiness is not something that's constant. It's a temporary right. thing. And, like, that's okay. That's normal. We don't have to always be smiling. We don't have to always be happy. Um, neutral is fine. <laughs> Sad is mm -hmm. also fine. Um, so those were ways, you know, I think that this is what was behind the scenes with my parents in terms of expectations for me and my happiness to not be bored, to smile more. But yeah. naturally through their subtle programming, and just, you know, being a child, I think I found a lot of my happiness through seeking out, like, comforts, whether that was combating <laughs> boredom through, like, imagining things. Nice. I had a very active imagination. I like that. I would imagine scenarios. I, I didn't have imaginary friends, but I had imaginary yes. situations a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. And I also turned towards reading, which I loved. You know, I would read a bunch, mm -hmm. loved it, still do. Right. I was Food. a kid. I like to watch TV. Yeah. That's a very kid thing, right? Happy yes. TV shows were definitely a go-to comfort. And food. Food can be happiness, 100%. It can be happiness. It can be love. Right. It can be all the things. <laughs> um. I feel like growing up when I was really on my own and like my parents, you know, we have a typical, you know, immigrant story, right? You know, parents came like with what, $10 in their pocket, right. they hustle cultured, work their, you know, butts off and like really all of that, right? So during that time when I was primarily alone, and of course, I was an only child, this is how I kind of entertained myself and sought out my own happinesses and those little things, imaginative play, reading, TV shows, food, things like that. Um, yeah. And then, I, you know, as I kind of grew up a little bit, we lived a little bit closer to family. And I found my happiness in a little bit more things other than those things. It was also in the little moments mm -hmm. with my family, like mm -hmm. getting to do like movie nights, Bollywood nights, getting to do chat night, you know, just kind of like little moments that we got to foster and just a lot of like happiness and joy through the connection that we yeah. talked about earlier. Um, and then, you know, from there, as I grew up even more, I went off to college and like, as you know, and as everybody knows now at this point, who's listened to this podcast, I had a very angry college couple of years as I, you know, really confronted a lot of my, um, emotional wounds and all of that. Yeah. But after therapy and after like beginning the healing process, that's when I started being a little bit more intentional and active in seeking out like happiness, like really being on a quest for happiness. That's when it really began for me. Um, and I think it, it basically took like having the happiness as a child, falling off that road for a while to realize like, oh, it's something that I actually need to be active about, especially as an adult. You can't just kind of sit by and mm -hmm, hope you get lucky with the happiness. You know, sometimes it takes a bit of work. So for me, my happiness, it 
really came after you know therapy yeah. work after college when I started breaking people pleasing tendencies that I had when I started you know setting and enforcing my boundaries when I started con- well when I continued to heal and reparent my inner child that's when I was able to really journey towards that happiness again and like start embodying those states of beings a little bit more often wow um that's awesome I, yeah And I actually really vividly remember a conversation. So a bunch of us, like a whole family, lots of different families in the big like family in Dallas, we went to some cabins on a little trip for a weekend. And when we were there, Mm -hmm. I remember one night we were all sitting in a circle and we were all like going around sharing like, what are our dreams and goals in our life? Yeah. And Everyone had like maybe specific dreams and goals or they had like really vague like I don't know. But my like dream and goal, I didn't even have to think about it. What I said was my dream and goal in this life is to just constantly seek out happiness. Oh, nice. I had like such clarity. And I remember like I wasn't thinking this, but I just kind of like blurted out. I was like I knew this is what it – because I was in that like stage of my life at that moment. But everybody else was like, whoa, like that's so profound. I'm like those are yeah. so – you know, like for a child, I mean, they see me as a child. I was not a child. I was an adult. <laughs> <laughs> they were just like, wow, like that. What else is there other than happiness? Right. Yes. And I realized too, now that I'm looking back on it, I think that I had that deep sense of clarity that that is what I'm seeking in life. Not just because of the healing thing that I went through and like being on the si- other side of like anger and sadness and grief. But also because that was around the time that, you know, I've talked about, right, like my family has my parents and my second set of parents, my aunt and uncle, they've decided to move to India. So it was right Mm -hmm. around that time my aunt and uncle moved and my parents were getting ready to move. And I think the grief that I had then of not being able to like control them moving away and like them, you know, not wanting them to move away. I think that's what sparked this idea of like, man, like I saw my family as like huge sources of happiness for me. Right. And like, of course, we'll still stay connected if they're far away. But like, I can't control what they do. They want to go. And I can't control that. So like, it's like my sense of happiness almost was like walking out the door and flying away. So it really kind of gave me that like awakening moment of, oh, like happiness is really internal though. Like, yes, I can get it from these external connections I have but you can't rely on just those alone you have to rely internal sources of happiness and so I think that's why I had this like deep clarity in that moment of like yeah my life's goal my life's dream is to just seek out happiness I love that that's so profound and meaningful yes yeah it really it came like it was born out of that very like I think profound recognition that we really only have ourselves to control we can't control anybody else even our Mm -hmm. loved ones and they might make choices that distance themselves physically maybe not emotionally Mm -hmm. but even then physically or emotionally we can't do anything about it but that doesn't mean we stop being happy we have to turn inwards we have to find those sources elsewhere right yeah so after that cabin trip after that realization after having you know, set boundaries, healed my inner child, all of that. It's a, it's a process. But what mm-hmm. I've been trying to do in the present tense and like continuing to do is I've been rekindling my love for love and storytelling. Um, <laughs> I had stopped reading a, a long time ago. I just got busy. Life happened. But I've recently last year restarted reading and I've been really into this like huge nerd out for South Asian authors like yeah. particularly romance authors, but like South Asian. And I love it. Not just South Asian authors, but like other AAPI authors and like yeah. loving the culture, the representation, loving getting to like explore lighthearted, comedic, like lovely stories with a cultural spin like that. Um, exactly. I love that. I need yeah. to get my hands on one on a book. I have so many recommendations. Check it out. Hit me up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, I've also been – this wasn't that recent. This has been a couple of years now, but I've been watching a lot of like Korean dramas and like I just started watching Chinese dramas and like I love 
immersing myself in like this new culture and like the new food because I see it on TV and I'm like I want to eat that so I go out and try it (laughs) and it's amazing I love it yeah so like you know really like rekindling like I said right like that inner child joy of like exploring and like just anything that feels joy so you don't have to overthink it you don't have to think like is this what I should be doing is this the right thing to do with my time just what brings you joy and like kind of seeking it out so these Mm -hmm. um activities I would consider them right reading Mm -hmm. watching tv they are activities yeah yeah even like dancing I've recently as of the last couple of months found my dance joy once again wow I love that been quite a hiatus from dancing but I'm back at it (laughs) what kind of dance are you doing these days I kind of just play a playlist of either like Bollywood songs or like Telugu Tollywood songs and then just let my body move it's been fun um but I will say like all of these are like wonderful exciting things that I have been doing actively But it's not all like smooth sailing, right? There are some bumpy roads here and there. And I'll give you a great example. Just this past weekend, Adi and I were having a conversation about um, like our spending and like what we were spending on and things like that. And I blurted out like, oh, like I've just been really wanting to buy these like really cute like iPhone cases and like AirPod case, like an iPad case, like just because I have all of the boringest stuff. I have like a black case. It's just a solid black case. And I was like, yeah, this is so depressing for me to look at. Like I want something lively and like cute to look at. And so I had for like six months, I had these adorable Appa AirPod case in my Amazon cart. I had this adorable cookies and bear like 3D looking case and like these cute little dumpling ones in my cart. Oh, so cute. They weren't that expensive. Ten bucks each maybe yeah. like 15 max on one of them and yet like I didn't spend on myself I wasn't I was like mm. it's unnecessary I don't need it you don't need that mm-hmm. let's not do it and you know what I just thought of when I was thinking that this past weekend exactly what right. your TikTok person said you mm-hmm. hear no for unnecessary purchases long enough you stop yourself from purchasing it even as an adult exactly that makes sense but I'm Adi, so- when he heard it, he was like, he was like, no, time out. He was like, excuse me, it's 10 bucks. If it makes you happy, just buy it. And I yeah. was, I literally put up a fight for like 10 minutes, but I don't need it. It's a waste of money. And then eventually that night, as he kept like forcing me, like, just do it, just get it, just do it. I thought about it and I was like, this would make my inner child happy. Like I'm giggling yeah. just looking at it on the phone. Yeah. yeah. Why? It's 10 bucks. Like it's not going right. to make or, but this- you know, break the bank. And it's just like, you know, yet another way to, you know, peel your inner child is like just little things, little joys, whether it's people, whether it's things, whether it's activities. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's not not. harming anyone. It's very healthy. Right. Why not indulge, right? And I love that this experience shed light on how you view, have you been, been viewing and trained to view these types of things. So it's good that like you had this realization, this epiphany, like it's okay to indulge even a little bit on yourself but we've been trained for so long that like even something small like that right which again could be another whole episode and right it's a scarcity right i was like "Hmm, maybe we'll add thought about it i was like "Mm -hmm." (laughs) but Mm -hmm. i think i know but i think you're (laughs) spot on that like it's it's really important to keep in mind that The the thinking patterns that we have are not only ours. It's also something that are maybe how we were raised and how other that our parents and our caregivers' thinking patterns are, and they don't have to be ours if they we don't want them to be. It's okay to change them, and it's okay to work towards Mm -hmm. changing them. And like, no, no, I was just saying, it's okay to work towards changing them. Changing them. Yeah, no, exactly. And to go off of what you're saying, though, it's also okay if like at that time, that was just what was like necessary. Right, right. It wasn't your money. Right. (laughs) You know, it was your parents' money. If they felt that was unnecessary, okay, like maybe that's okay. But you know, as an adult, Mm -hmm. when you're making your own money, Mm -hmm. it doesn't still Mm -hmm. need to be unnecessary. I love how like your examples of you trying to find those pockets of happiness has to do with like, 
you know, connection, but also like internal, like what you can control, right? Like your reading and your imaginary situations, like all these little things Mm -hmm. that you had control over that brought (laughs) meaning to your life. Um, And I think I share that something similar to like whenever like seeking happiness for me was the same. Like I was trying to find pockets of things and actions that I could take on my own that could bring meaning to me or there are only mine. So I love that. Mm. I love how despite the cultural norms that we grew up with, we found our own pockets of happiness in different ways. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. And here's to (laughs) many, many more of that. It's a journey. It's a quest. We're on the quest. It'll keep happening. <laughs> you gonna wrap us up? Alrighty. Well, that's all for my story. Yeah. Shall we wrap up? <laughs> all right. Well, then to wrap us up, just a reminder: if our podcast resonated with you and you'd like to share your story with us or ask any questions, you can reach us at our Gmail account, talk South Asian to me at Gmail dot com or find us on all the socials at the handle at talk south asian to me yay thank you so much for listening we will see you all at the next episode and in case anybody's curious i will go ahead and maybe post a, on a story our my like cute little my cute finds that i actually yes. ended up buying and i just got i'll post yes, it on the story I see <laughs> all righty then bye see everyone next episode bye Mm-hmm. <laughs>